Hi, Paul Dennett here. Just letting you know that Cricket Unfiltered is now on Patreon. If you are a fan of our show and would like to support us with a few dollars each month, go to patreon.com slash cricket unfiltered or click the link in the show notes on your podcast app. Men is here. Our Patreon supporters will also get some pretty cool bonus content. Paul will be doing a series of cricket history podcasts. And Menas will be doing long-form interviews with leading cricket personalities. All of these shows, plus other bonus features, will be available exclusively to our Patreon supporters. So if you want some great extra content, or if you just love the show and would like to help support us financially, please go to patreon.com slash cricketunfiltered. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Cricket Unfiltered podcast. I'm Menas, and I'm joined by Jaleesa remotely because there's been a COVID outbreak in Sydney, so we're back to Zoom recordings. Jaleesa, unfortunately, I don't get the the you the I don't get to be blessed with your presence today. How are you? Oh, I know it's a shame for many people at the moment who aren't blessed with my presence, but I'm here in spirit. Fantastic. Great to have you on. Paul Dennett is dialing in as well from another part of Sydney. How are you? I'm great. I know New Zealand technically are the big high achievers, but once again, I've just shown my class, watched the cricket all the way through till the best part of 4am and um, I, I really am good at watching cricket. <laughs> Congratulations. Can I just say, I did, I did something really good, Manners. Do you want to hear what I did? Yes. I printed the notes. Fantastic. Like yeah, even a plus, remotely. A plus. I have to take that all my commitment is phenomenal. Yeah, the next step is actually adding something to them. <laughs> no, I like to go off the cuff. I don't write my scripts. I just go off in my head. Not exactly scripts. Uh, anyway, um, in today's show, we're going to wrap up New Zealand's win in the World Test Championship final. Paul Dennett's going to eat some humble pie. There's a little bit huh? of quick. Cric- what was that? What? Well, you, you wrote off the Kiwis. No, I didn't. Don't you listen to Cricket Unfiltered? Oh, you, you, you sort of, didn't you say the Kiwis uh, aren't the best team in the world? Yeah, then the, then the last show I ate humble pie. You gave me an opportunity to do it. And now you're asking me to do it again for no yeah. reason. Yeah, keep eating. He's keep full. eating. I'm full. <laughs> okay. Well, maybe um, I'll be eating humble pie after going <laughs> for the Indians. And then um, we've got a little bit of cricket news. Aaron Finch made some comments about the Australians going to the IPL. I've got an exclusive, um, an exclusive story about a change in Australian cricket. And uh, then we'll just wrap it up with Can't Let It Go. It's going to be a short show today, recording via Zoom. Um, it's throwing things out a little bit. Um, but look, let's get straight into it. Uh, New Zealand have, have won the World Test Championship. I guess, Paul, you did a cricket daily today. Just want to run us through some of the main points. Yeah, so it began with India two down and Coley at the crease and it was about half an hour where not much happened and then all of a sudden Kyle Jamieson had one ball that rocked back into Coley and smashed him uh, on the thigh and that got him playing at one, wafted at it, caught behind by Watling and they promptly collapsed, uh, punctuated in between by Rishabh Punt playing another exhilarating innings, his mixture of defence and charging the bowling. But as it all panned out, New Zealand needed only 139 to win. They had to work hard. India bowled really well, and Williamson and Taylor were all quality. They both finished. Uh, Williamson just got a 50 not out. Taylor in the 40s not out. New Zealand got the job done in the in the gathering evening. For once, it was a nice, fine day in Southampton. And so six-day test match finished about an hour and five minutes after the scheduled stumps time. And after 144 years, test cricket has a champion. Absolutely. Jaleesa, what a great story it is, isn't it? After the Kiwis cruelly lost the 50-over World Cup, this is a great boost for their cricket. Yeah, um, it was an incredible finish to a test match that I think a lot of us had sort of written off in the first few days when there was that rain. Even with the reserve day, you just thought this is headed for a draw and everyone was seemed to me like quite disappointed at the way that two years was about to end. But um, it just Jamison was just insane, just the, the way that he sort of pulled that victory out for New Zealand. And even when... Um, 
when he got Coley out, I was sort of sitting there thinking um, that Pajara could bat. You know, he'll he'll be he can be in there all day, but he's still not going to win you the test. And then Rishabh Pant is just he's terrifying because he's very unique in in the sense of he he's got something that no one else I think in test as a test batsman has got at the moment. It's just the ability to score so quickly. Like, you know, a lot of test batsmen can, you know, sit there all day and, and end up getting the runs, but he can do it so quickly. So um, when he, when he was out, I think that was, um, that was where you sort of really knew, okay, this is quite a match on here, but um, an incredible win by New Zealand. And I was firmly on New Zealand. So I was really happy. Mm. Good to hear. I thought India never had a chance at winning the game. I thought it would be you know, a very small chance that they could win on the final day. But I thought what Pant could do was just score so quickly that it put it put the game out of reach for the Kiwis. But uh, they got him just as he was really getting going. And, and from there, well, the Kiwis stormed home. Um, fantastic for them. But uh, Virat Kohli made some comments after the game. Here's a quote from him. We are not too bothered by this result because we understand as a test side what we've done over the last three or four years, not just over the last 18 months. This is not a measure of who we are as a team. And I think he's he's really making the point that this is a one-off test match and India, well, against Australia and England and plenty of other sides have come back from losing a match in the series and then winning the series. Paul, do you think that's a fair point from Virat or, or do you think sour grapes? No, and there's no sour grapes, man. As, um, I know you're trying to create a headline, but I, I think that if you look at the, the whole stuff of what he said, he gave credit to New Zealand. And he was saying before the test match that he favoured a, a three-test match final series for the World Test Championship. He's going to cop a lot of criticism from the, the passionate fans in India. So I, I think I think he's actually become quite a statesman for the game. And um, I, I think test cricket is lucky to have him, and I thought he was completely fine on the, what he said. Do you think he has a point, though, about the fact that this is a one-off test match? He does, but that's the nature of um, sport, that you've, you've got to make the choice between drama and maybe fairness, that the, the World Cup of Soccer is the, the perfect example of where you really shouldn't have it as knockout games. Every other soccer league is a, a massive, long, long season of where there's no actual final. It's all first past the post. If you're going to be f- fair, you'd have a five test match series to decide the winner. And you would then have a, a real person, a team that could say, yes, we deserve to be the winners, but you forsake all the drama that one test can have. I, I, I kind of tend to agree with you. I'd be quite happy with a three test series, but it would, it, you've got to admit this did have a, a nice finality about it, that it was done and dusted straight away in the way that most major sporting competitions do end. What do you think, Jaleesa? Well, I just think, um, first of all, when, when you were saying that um, you thought that they couldn't, that the sort of the best they could do was put a win out of reach for New Zealand, I would ordinarily have said the same thing, except I kept having memories of the Gabba haunt me where we thought that that was going to be the same as well, and they did manage a win. Um, so that uh, that's one point. But then the set, what you were saying about... Um, Vicoli, look, I think he has a point. Like it's, it doesn't really reflect on your whole, your whole team, you know, over the, that two years. But at the end of the day, I think, uh, look, the, uh, the only thing that I find, uh, I found his comments a little bit like that. I found that one little line a bit salty. I think in the context of everything, he was probably very gracious, but I just thought, oh, that one line's a little bit salty. Probably didn't need to be said. But I also think that the, to have one final, it's, it, I get what Paul's saying, but it's really weird to have a final where to get into that final, you've not played one test, like you've played series, and then all of a sudden the final isn't a series. I find that, I just find that really bizarre. Yeah, I guess it like is. you wouldn't play yeah. multiple matches, you know, you've played series. A, a format of series to get into the final, then why shouldn't the final be a series? And um, yeah, I sort of, I still think that it should be a three, um, a three game series to decide, to decide the winner of the final, not a final, but it does add a nice bit of drama to it. You mentioned cricket daily men as um, speaking to Barrett Sunderason today. He said, as an Indian fan, 
there was a moment when Kane Williamson was actually given out LBW just after he came in and it was overturned on review. But that would have made New Zealand two out. As it turned out, they did then did lose another another wicket quite quickly. And he said that at that point, at the moment that Williamson was given out, he still thought um, there was a chance that India could win. And watching it live, I thought, oh, this is going to be suddenly put a lot of pressure on the New Zealand dressing room and there'll be a, a temptation to really go into their shells. So it, it could have even been an Indian win on the last day. Yeah, I mean, I, that, yeah, that was the only sort of chance if New Zealand just completely capitulated in that last afternoon. I felt like the game was anyone's the whole time. Like, sort of, I, I couldn't, once it sort of really got going, I thought, okay, well, this this could end up, we could have, have a result either way. Well, the Kiwis got the result they were desperate for. A team known for losing finals, not winning them, will manage to get over the line. It was a magic performance and a, a magic moment for New Zealand cricket. I mean, I, I wonder what this could do to cricket in New Zealand. I, I wonder if we would be talking about this game in a really different context, though, had the rain ruined it. Because I know it didn't bother you as much, Paul, because I follow your tweets, but it really bothered me that this was potentially going to end in a draw um, because of rain. It was just infuriating to me that you could come to two years to come to that. Oh, it bothered me as well because I had money on both sides, so I needed it <laughs> to not be a draw. <laughs> but um, uh, I'll get to it and can't let it go, but I think it highlights the um, – well, we'll save it for them, but I've got I've got an answer for that. But um, stay tuned. <laughs> stay tuned oh, for Can't Let It Go. What a teaser! <laughs> I don't want to have to invent another Can't Let It Go on the spot. Yeah, leave that to Julissa. Um, <laughs> so, congratulations to the Kiwis. I was supporting India, but I'm glad New Zealand won. I think though, Virat has a point that. India are probably the best test side in the world at the moment with New Zealand slightly behind them. You'd, you'd back India in all conditions ahead of New Zealand. But I think it's, it's a little bit about conditioning that we have to get used to this concept of having a, a showpiece test playoff, one game where it's all on the line. And uh, I do think if you moved it to three test matches, you would bring in a, a whole other set of problems you know, what if one was draw? What if the series was drawn? What if weather affected it? Would you have these three tests being played over, you know, six or seven days, which is mean you'd, you know, you'd, you'd need lots of time to complete these three test matches. So uh, I sort of, I'm leaning towards a one-off super test like this um, with maybe two reserve days next time so that there's no chance of it really being um, completely washed out unless they play in Sydney. You know, it'd be pretty cool if they had a three test series and it was always the three test matches were one at the MCG, one at Lords and one at Eden Gardens. That'd test all, all different types of skills and um, that'd be quite cool. I agree, yeah. Take it on tour. Oh, by the way, Jaleesa, um, I reflected on a question you asked the other week where you said that if New Zealand was playing Go Australia on. in New Zealand, that you think New Zealand might win. And I was quite dismissive. I'm starting to come around to you. I think that... Um, uh, maybe uh, there is a bit of extra humble pie I do need to eat. Uh, Jameson has just floored me. Um, I wish yeah. I want to be. I want to be Kyle Jameson so much. Um, he's six foot eight. He bats. He bowls. He's got a jaw like granite. Uh, <laughs> so cool. Um, and um, I think that he ha- elevates this New Zealand side from a very good side to something even better. And we struggle against him in in, in, in New Zealand conditions. He's now got an average of 14.2 with the ball after eight tests. It's going to be hard to keep it at that level, but what a start to his career. I think he's made the difference to this Kiwi side because, yeah. you know, Trent, Trent Bolt and um, Southie are great bowlers backed up by Wagner. But when you add in Jameson to come on basically first change, uh, it just adds so much. It's a bit like when Stray brought Cummins in and added him to the attack. It just means that, There's constant pressure on the opposition batters. All right. So that's the World Test Championship final. Congratulations to our little cousins across the ditch. Uh, Hopefully Australia can win the next one. It was very disappointing that Australia weren't there, especially um, seeing the Kiwis. What was that? David Boone's fault, docking us. uh, Well, that's not his fault. It's the Australian fault for bowling slowly. I know, but he could have. He could have. Booney, well, yeah. <laughs> Booney did the right thing. Um, we all hate slow overrates. 
Um, all right, let's get on to the cricket headlines brought to you by Piccolo Podcasts. First one, Michael Vaughan wants to call off the ashes. Michael Vaughan tweeted, I read reports today that England cricketers may not be able to have family members with them down under this winter. Quite simply, if they can't, they should call the ashes off. Four months away from your family is totally unacceptable. Um, You're scared, Michael. You're scared. (laughs) I think Vaughan, just wants to bring his family down under. That's why he's um, disappointed. To be fair, I think they should allow them in. And I think that, we have to get on with our vaccinations in this country and uh, we can't, we, we've done really well with the pandemic. But we can't adopt a siege mentality forever. We needed to. It is a race. We should have all been vaccinated by now. And the Ashes brings an enormous amount of money into the country. It's a tradition that's been going on since 1882. I think that it's quite fair enough to say that for the, you know, the 20 or 30 family members that it would be, that they should be allowed to be in as long as they're vaccinated and they should get a bit of special treatment. Yeah, I agree with you, Paul. I think that they could, um, yeah, like as we sort of start to move a little bit to normality with um, vaccinations, I think uh, it's fine to bring them in. But I don't know. I I feel like Michael Vaughan was just kind of sort of lashing out for no reason here. They haven't been said that they can't bring them in yet. Like it's sort of still all up in the air. Um, and how many families actually come? I'm confused about that because I, I don't think a lot of, do, like not all of the Australian families go on tour with them. Is it a different thing in England? Do a lot of their families come out? I'm a bit confused. I feel like this is a little bit of a storm in the teacup at the moment. It's an issue that's been fraught for a long time. I remember in 89, Alan Border made the decision, we're not having families, at least until we win the Ashes, that um, we've got a job to do, <laughs> we're not going to have it. Back in the old days, in the 1930s, the Australian cricketers actually had to sign a contract that for, forbade their wives from entering the United Kingdom in the entire time that they were over there, uh, which is just extraordinary. Um, but you know, I think these days, more often than not, if they can, they bring them along, at least for part of the way. Yeah, I, I think that this is complete... Um, crap from Vaughan. There's no way they're going to call the ashes off. That's just never going to happen. Uh, if they did, Australia would hold the ashes to 2023. So I'm not disappointed with that. But um, uh, my understanding is that the Indian cricket team were actually in the end allowed to bring three or four families with them last summer in their big bubble for the tour. And I'm sure that Australia could give the same concessions to England. And the, the point is some of these players are coming they're saying some of these English players will come straight from the World T20 tournament in the UAE to Australia and therefore it'll be four months on tour without a break. And I, I agree with Vaughan, there should be some effort made to get those people with their families in Australia. Yep, for sure. All right. The next cricket headline, Jared Waitley, the host of um, – uh, on SEN said that it it is inarguable that Australia's World Cup preparations have been hampered this year by the withdrawal of players from this latest tour to the West Indies. And that goes on top of the, the New Zealand tour earlier this year that a lot of the players were unavailable for. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, do you think Australia's preparations are being hampered? Yeah, definitely. But I think that it's, it's partially the... Un- unprecedented circumstances in which we live and it's partially that a- as always we tend to prioritize international t20 cricket below the other forms that uh, if we took a sort, of, sort of a more indian mindset to this we'd probably be saying come on guys you've got to go on these tours now but you can have the ashes off i mean that's something that no one in australia would think of but um the rest of the world certainly the subcontinent regards the t20 world cup is much, much more important than any test series. We and England still, and I hope we always do, regard the Ashes as massive and you just can't prioritise everything, I suppose. What do you think, Jaleesa? Yeah, I just think, like, we just all probably need to stop criticising everything. Like, everyone's sort of doing their best to get as much cricket going as possible and um, it's just, at the moment, it's just, yeah, probably the preparation is hampered, but it is the way that the of the conditions at the moment. We just sort of have to grin and bear it. Yeah, I, I agree. 
Yeah, I agree. Um, Aaron Finch made some comments on SEN radio last week saying that he thinks players um, can't go back to the IPL and play that second half of the IPL, um, taking into account the heavy workload that will come after that. And I've reflected on what Finch said, and I 100% agree with him. Australia's priority is our home summer and the Ashes. There is no way we can allow our international players to go wear themselves out at the IPL. They'll play the World T20. They'll come back and they'll have to rest in Australia because they'll be burnt out from the IPL before the World T20. I think... We have to preserve our players so that they're able to take part in our summer as much as possible. Well, that's a pretty easy take from somebody who didn't get picked up. Like, (laughs) God. Like, Uh, you know, it's easy for someone who uh, put themselves up for the IPL and didn't get taken up by a club to then go, well, none of you can play now. I. I think it's a, I don't know, I think that's a bit of a cheap shot. I get what he's saying, but um, at the end of the day, they have they have um, contracts that they've committed to and they they didn't cause the, the pause of the IPL. There's no, they couldn't have um, really foreseen that. So uh, I think that's a, it's a pretty e- easy to say that when you're not in the position of earning a lot of money and also having to fulfill your contract. I think Minch, Finch makes a very good point. We don't want these players coming back They'll come straight back into an Ashes. Maybe some of them will say, oh, can I just sit out this test against Afghanistan? I'm a bit tired. I need to freshen up for the Ashes. And then after the Ashes, I'll oh, burnt out, completely um, sizzled, can't play in the Big Bash, need a break, can't tour with the Aussies, need but- a break. Uh, it's, at some point, you just got to say the IPL had its chance. They stuffed it up by being so stubborn and playing it in India. Bad luck. You can't have our players. Look, uh, yeah, and I agree. I would probably, if I was in the privileged position of that, I probably wouldn't go back to the IPL. But you can't begrudge someone who does go back because, again, I think it's, would Finch be saying that if he had, uh, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars on the line at the end of the day? Like, I don't. Yeah, he would. He would. Absolutely. You you think he would? Yep, 100%. Yeah, I don't know. I'd, I'd like to see in that position. I think it's, um, yeah. I, I don't begrudge them. I don't begrudge anybody who does go back to the IPL. I can see why you wouldn't want to for your own sake of just ne- having a bit of a break and knowing that you're going to be a bit more fresh. I can. I personally couldn't think of anything worse. But if they go back to the IPL, they go back to the IPL. What about Shane Warne and Mark War said on their podcast? I don't know if you've heard there in our competition now. It's Road to the Ashes. If you want to listen to um, them talk about cricket, um, it's pretty good. Um, but they were saying that. Um, you know, they think that the Australian selectors should start to maybe think about players that prioritise national cricket ahead of uh, franchise cricket. And what do you think that has some merit? If someone were to go back to the IPL, maybe you would, um, you know, maybe consider a bit more closely whether they deserve to play for Australia again? I want to win the tournament. So I think that they should pick the best players, best players for Australia and I've said it many times, but th- there is that factor that the IPL could actually be good preparation uh, for the World Cup, given that they're going to be in the same venues. I, I understand what you're saying, Menas, but I think that I really want us to win a World Cup of, of T20 cricket, and I place it right up there in, in priorities alongside the Ashes and much, much more ahead of the the Big Bash or, or anything else. So if, if the Cricket Australia deems that it's in someone's interest to go to the IPL or good preparation for the World Cup, and that that means that on the back end they have to miss the test against Afghanistan and they have to miss the, the big bash, I'm fine with that if that's the decision they make, if they think it's good preparation. Oh, yeah, disagree. I, I don't think the Australian players should be sitting out of matches in the Australian summer to play in the IPL, and I don't know if it's no, going But I'm to not be saying the- that. I'm not saying that they should sit out to play in the IPL. I'm saying they should sit out to play in a valuable tournament in warm-up for the World Cup. Yeah, but that's the IPL that you're talking about. Yeah, but I'm saying I want us to win the World Cup. Um, if we no, win the yeah. World Cup and at, at the expense of a few players missing um, some of the big bash, I'll take that every time. Yeah, I, I think it's debatable whether the IPL will be great preparation for them, perhaps getting our squad together and um, you know building some team harmony and um, maybe playing some practice matches together might be a, a better route to go than wearing them out in the IPL. 
Well, that's a separate point, and I, I, it could be argued both ways. I still think that preparation in the venues that you're going to be playing at is the is the key, and I think things like cohesion and harmony. Um, as someone who bets on the game, those things really don't matter that much. <laughs> I knew you'd say that. <laughs> uh, speaking of cohesion and harmony, I'll, I'll give out my exclusive story. That, um, it's better be good. It's yes, not good. We've been waiting for this, Metas. I've got this it up, in the it's... Channel 10 sports rundown tonight, so it better be good. Well, the Australian cricket team was supposed to have kind of a cultural camp this weekend, which was going to be, um, you know, meetings run by Justin Langer and um, all of the – all of the Australian players are actually going to go up for it. Even Smith and Cummins and all those players who even aren't going to the West Indies were going to go up for this cultural camp. But because of the COVID outbreak, it's been basically cancelled and they're going to have to reschedule it to later in the year. So no culture camp, no Australian cricket culture camp. Aren't they lucky? That would have been an absolute <laughs> bore. But, but uh, I know you, you say... I know, you, but after what Steve happened with Smith's probably running around Bondi Junction, close contacting as many people as he can. You're just going into Westfield without a mask on and like, yeah, uh, running around. Uh, the yeah, only thing is, COVID. yeah, the only thing is, you know, after the stories about Langer and the reviews came out, I actually think this would have been very valuable for the team to just get all that shit out of the way and put it behind them, um, get them all in a room together. Um, get it all out, move on. So I actually think it is disappointing that they're not going to have that opportunity. Um, yeah. This reminds me of when um, corporate or companies, you know, like get do the survey of like employees, like how happy are you are at work? And then they realise everyone's like super unhappy for some reason and, and they're like, right, let's have a pizza party on a Friday. <laughs> So, um, okay, I was going to so, say the same thing that it's like a big corporate conference and everyone goes and endures the six hours of um, bonding exercises just to get to the bar afterwards. Yeah. So, yeah, Paul, exactly. Paul, give me a mark out of 10 how you're feeling about this podcast that we're doing right now. Oh, oh. this podcast, oh, I think, you know, 9.8, 9.9. Jaleesa? Are we talking about this episode? Yeah, this episode. I want to know how you're feeling. Give me a mark out of 10. It's my, my um, new cultural. I'm like a nine. I feel a good. nine. Wow. Are you obviously hating on us, Paul? <laughs> what have we done? I'm giving it a six. Um, oh, you hate recording Zooms, and I think you come into the mentality of a Zoom just hating it. And then Ironically, can we keep the audio like that, Paul? Of her, <laughs> her being literally almost, you know, illegible or un- inaudible <laughs> saying that. That's why I hate Zoom. Um, oh, this is going to be a fun edit, guys. <laughs> yeah, Paul's thrilled about this. Um, all right. Um, so, I like this one. I'm happy. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, I think, though, <laughs> looking at this squad that's going to the West Indies, I've picked a few plays that I think – have an opportunity, as Trevor Hone said, to force their way into the World Cup squad. So I think um, Dan Christian obviously has an opportunity. I think Jason Berendorf is a big one that could force his way into the World T20 squad. Then I think Josh Hazelwood, Moses Enriquez, and finally, I think Tanvir Sanger. He's going as a travelling reserve, but I like the idea of Australia taking a, a mystery spinner to the World T20 in the UAE. So, yeah, they're my sort of picks of who could jump out of this squad to the West Indies into the sort of uh, World T20 squad. Have you got anyone in mind? I agree with those, and I'd also add um, Ashton Turner. If he could have a big a, a big tour, then I could see him catapulting back into the squad as well. Jaleesa, you printed the notes out, so you got the squad in front of you. I've got no valuable thoughts, to be honest, that if you guys haven't said. Good. I like that. I'll give that comment a 9 out of 10. Um, <laughs> all right. Now, uh, moving on, last couple of um, bits of headlines before Can't Let It Go. It's going to be a short show, although I do want to answer a, a viewer that sent me something, actually, uh, in viewer mails or some tweets. Um, but uh, just the Aussies overseas, Usman Khawaja made a century for Islamabad last week. And uh, he, he made a 70 um, in, a, in a playoff game for Islamabad United. So I think Usman Khawaja, not only is he good, is good form, but I think he m- might become a very, very valuable commodity in T20 leagues around the world because he's probably not going to get back into the Aussie team, but he's still a very good player. 
Josh Inglis, the the WA wicketkeeper batsman, hit a, a wonderful century in the Vitality T20 Blast in the last week. That's his first T20 ton. And I want Josh Inglis to be the next keeper for Australia. I think that um, as much as I like Carey, Inglis is just a far better player. And Maxwell for me. Maxwell. Maxwell keeper, batsman. I'm sure he'd be a better keeper than all of them. No. Uh, but then he wouldn't be able to bowl. That'd be a second over. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And um, reports from cricket.com.au that uh, soon the contracting embargo will lift in the Big Bash and and uh, an announcement will be made about the international draft. So that's, that's a pretty big one because I'd love to see an international draft come into the competition. And I think we need it. Great idea. Just a huge talking point as well. It keeps the, the sport in the headlines for that little bit longer. Absolutely. What do you think, Jaleesa? Would you like to see an international draft? Yeah, for sure. I love watching the um, the IPL. I'd find, I'd find the whole thing quite fascinating and I think it would create a lot more excitement around or who's going to be in and who's going to be out. It would be interesting. I can't believe we're already talking about the Big Bash. It would be interesting to see um, how it all sort of pans out this year given all the disruption there was last year with COVID and then Channel 7 and I, I just wonder if there's we're going to see the same because no doubt it will still be impacted in some way by COVID and I just wonder if it's um if that's all going to flare up again. Yep well as as you both know we're in the middle of a flare up in Sydney so you just never know good luck being a sports administrator right now. Could they do a thing like give out, like do vaccinations as you enter a big bash game just to just to hurry up this process? Um, well, I don't know. I don't know. I, I just am not eligible. So I would be going to get one at a big bash game, at a soccer game, at any damn game you want. I'm just not eligible. Yeah, Paul and I are eligible because we're a lot older. Mm, lucky. All right. That with the cricket headlines, we'll qu- take a quick break. Then we'll be back with viewer mail and can't let it go. Welcome back to the Cricket Unfiltered podcast. I'm Menes. I'm with Jaleesa and Paul, and it's the end of the show. We've got viewer mail and can't let it go. Now, I got a tweet from Fred1971, and this is what he wrote. Um, amen is I'm a couple of weeks behind, but have just listened to your cricket daily podcast where you discuss Ollie Robinson. When he wrote those tweets, he was old enough to drive, marry, vote, drink. And at no point did you consider any victims arms. I'll park that there. And I wrote back, I think you must have missed misconstrued my point. His tweets were awful. I agree that he deserves punishment, but I'm also sympathetic. And then he wrote back. Um, criticizing Simon Mann and Simon Hughes for their podcast. But uh, I think we were pretty measured in our comments around Ollie Robinson. If Fred mis, mis, uh, understood, I, I was never endorsing Robinson's comments at all. Um, but I, I, I just had some sympathy for, you know, someone making the test taboo and the, the, that is the time those tweets are released. That is all. Um, the, the tweets were abhorrent. I don't think there could be any way that um, you can't see that all of us were saying um, that we um, that we don't condone those tweets. I, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think it's worth getting into an argument over because I think we're all on the same page that the tweets were abhorrent. Um, I don't know what you said on cricket on cricket daily. I didn't hear that, but um, I know that what you said on cricket unfiltered. I agreed with that um the tweets are abhorrent it's sad that um he ever wrote them perhaps he's not the same person today yeah i also don't think saying he was old enough to drive marry vote and drink um is a is a really good response does that mean at that age you can't make a mistake because you can hold a driver's license as long as that's not who the values that he holds today um and he's paid he's had a punishment he's paid the price for that as he should. And, um, yeah, like I can't, it would be really horrific if someone had wrote those today, then yeah. Yeah. I, 
on the same point, I was reading an article about Megan Shute yesterday, who was a guest on Menna's Masterclass recently, and she put out oh, a post. Oh, that was my Can't Let It Go. You're ruining things. Well, we'll get to don't that. Go, we'll go save ahead, it. Go no, ahead. Well, let's get on to Can't Let It Go, because that's viewer mail. Not much needs to be said there, but Fred, um, obviously, I'm very sympathetic to the victims. Those They were disgraceful comments, but um, I think not all issues are just black and white. All right, uh, Jaleesa, what's your Can't Let It Go? I think I know what it is. We can't hear you, Jaleesa. All right. Well, Paul, what's your can't let it go for this week? Jaleesa touched on it earlier, but I was very puzzled during the test match when the when the days were rained off at the level of anger towards the weather that was coming out of India. And it suddenly hit me the reason. I think it's because India has the monsoon and they have a defined rainy season and a defined dry season that their experience is that if you schedule a cricket game on during the dry season, it'll probably be fine. And so I think some of them have probably thought England have had the temerity to schedule the cricket during their wet season. And what they haven't realised is that England's wet season lasts for 365 days of the year. <laughs> um, that's, that's, well, exactly. It's, it's the same in Australia. That Sydney gets roughly even rain throughout the year, whereas Perth, and other places get no rain in the summer, so they can't understand why the SCG test match is, is so often rain affected. But there are so many of them saying you shouldn't schedule such an important game for a place where this can happen. And I'd say, well, if that's the case, that means that England can never have the World Test Championship final, nor can Sydney, Brisbane, Melbourne, and um, New Zealand for that matter, and, and plenty of other places as well. And so ironic that Hampshire, where the game was played, that's where cricket began 500 years ago, the first recordings of cricket are in southeast England in that Hampshire part of the world. So In Hambledon. I've been to Hambledon Cricket Club, Paul. Yes, exactly. Um, I've never been there, but I'd love to visit. So I think it was a very appropriate spot, given that Lords um, couldn't be used because of the pandemic, That and Hampshire has the – and the Southampton has the, the hotel on the ground. So I'm very pleased that, that in the end we did get a result and that Hampshire uh, was a worthy place to, to host – the first ever World Test Championship of the sport that they kind of invented half a millennium ago. I actually went to Hambledon for a charity match in the mid-90s and got to see Derek Underwood bowling. He must have been in his late 40s, early 50s then, bowling to Desmond Haynes and some great West Indian players who were playing in the charity game. And it's a lovely part of the world, beautiful little pub across the road from the ground. And Derek Underwood, terrific bowler, when Ian Chappell uh, – when Greg Chappell was on Men's Masterclass, he said Derek was one of the best bowlers he faced and certainly concur. All right, my can't let it go is that the Vitality T20 Blast is an awful competition for the fans. It is, I can see why the 100 has come in. The Blast is just terrible. If you're a cricket fan in England, there's no way you could follow it. There's so many games. It, it, it's basically like um, a glorified grade T uh, T20 competition that we have in Sydney. And I just think that the, the, the hundred cannot come quickly enough. Um, the blast, lovely cricket. Uh, you know, it's nice to watch because it's in those small grounds, but uh, awful competition for fans. Anybody in England that has resisted the urge to get on board with the hundred, honestly, get off your ass and start supporting the hundred because uh, English cricket needs it. The blast is awful. I agree. Uh, w- w- doing cricket daily, I've paid more attention to the blast than I ever have before. And I agree with you, it, it does look like a fun competition and it is nice and, and it does a, a, a nice job. But it's 133 games. It's got no cut through to the, to the wider population. Um, if cricket's to thrive in England, then it needs the 100. And if you don't like it, then um, challenge yourself to get on board because I think in the years to come, lots of people now who don't like it will like it, just as we were with the Big Bash a few years back. All right, Jaleesa, are you still there? No, we've lost her. All right, well, um, I'll just um, – Jaleesa's can't let it go is what a wonderful host Manners is of Cricket Unfiltered. <laughs> so it's, that's really nice. She sent me a message. Just She said she loves working with me. She looks forward to it every week, and um, it's the highlight of her week being on Cricket Unfiltered. Um, so really nice sentiments there from Jaleesa. Shame she couldn't say them herself, but 
I, I'm, I have the pleasure of passing them on. And look, I agree, Jaleesa. It, it is fantastic have, um, working with you every week. And obviously, Paul and I are very talented. So it must be um, really good for you to, you know, you're in that professional environment with so-called professional broadcasters, but then you come along and join you know, the best cricket podcast in Australia. So, yeah, really good. Can't let it go, Jaleesa. Um, and what cricket's your fa- cricket is still your favourite sport much more than NRL. Another good, another good can't let it go. Thank you. Um, well, Paul, uh, you're supposed to go away next week, but is this COVID pandemic um, scuppered those plans or are you still doing it? Hanging by a thread at this stage. I've been ensconced in cricket all morning and I've not really kept up to date with what's going on, but I'll touch base with the family this afternoon and we'll make a decision. But I'd say at this stage, it's about 50-50. Hopefully we can get away because it was going to be fun. Yeah, well, either way, Cricket Unfiltered is going to take a break next week. I think it's an appropriate time, regardless of whether Paul goes away or not. Just uh, while we can't be in the same room together, we'll just um, sit back, relax, enjoy the Kiwis' uh, victory, and we'll be back in a couple of weeks with another Cricket Unfiltered. Bye. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Bye, Jaleesa. I thought the last bit, Jaleesa, was outstanding. (laughs) And you can leave that in. 